Welcome back to the Big Tire Garage. This week's video I am very excited about because I know it's one that a lot of you have been asking me about on social media, and that is the entire step-by-step -step process of what it took to get a 2004 Toyota 2UZ V8 engine underneath the hood and running inside this second gen 2005 Tacoma while still keeping the manual trans and all of the vehicle functioning like the engine came in there from the factory. So hold on, this video is not short, but if you're thinking of V8 swapping your Tacoma, you're gonna know everything that you're gonna need to know to complete this swap by the end of this video. But before we get started, of course, gotta grab a cup of coffee. <laughs> For those of you not familiar with this truck, this is my 2005 second gen Tacoma. It's a standard cab short bed pickup. It is a manual transmission and I have already done the FJ Cruiser manual transfer case conversion behind that transmission. But before I run you through the specifics of this truck, let's go ahead and thank this week's sponsor, Solder Stick. Solder stick connectors are a very unique butt connector design that don't require any crimping. Basically the way it works is you have the butt connector in all the popular sizes from 26 gauge all the way up to 10 gauge wire. The center ring is not a crimp terminal, it's actually a piece of solder. You simply strip the ends of the wire feed them through the butt connector, and then heat it up with a heat gun. That's gonna allow the solder to melt as well as the heat shrink to melt on either end of the wire. The cool thing is, is these little bands that are on each one of the butt connectors not only identify it for the size, but they also act as a locking piece of heat shrink because once you've heated this up and the solder's melted and the heat shrink is melted, you'll end up with not only a waterproof, but an incredibly strong connection between two wires in the circuit. Now it's very convenient that Solder Stick is sponsoring this video because I'm gonna have to do some wiring underneath the dash of this Tacoma, basically splicing some wires together to get the V8 underneath the hood running. So I'm very excited to try out these connectors. I'm gonna put a discount code in the description below so you can get a deal on Solder Stick connectors for your shop. It's just one other thing you should definitely add to your toolbox to have at your disposal when doing some wiring. All right, so now the rundown on the Tacoma. Up front, I've got a set of Fiberworks fiberglass fenders to go with my long travel front suspension. Out back is a set of advanced fiberglass concepts rear bedsides. Now, the reason I chose those is because that was the only company that made that flat top on the fiberglass bedsides. Everyone else had like an arc to it, and that allows me to run that topper. All pro suspension all the way around. So this is their uh, long travel leaf spring setup, rad flow, smooth body shock with adjuster in the back. Up front, the suspension is also all pro. It's what they call their long travel slash mid travel kit. I believe it's like a two over or a three over on the front. Uh, and then a rad flow coil over as well with remote reservoir with adjusters on it. And when I had them put these shocks together, I told them that I was eventually planning a V8 swap. So they stepped up the spring rate right from the beginning. It's sitting on 35 inch tall tires, uh, method bead grip wheels, obviously, uh, all pro bumpers, both front and rear. Those are aluminum. It's got a worn winch in it and a set of all pro sliders on the side that I had to modify because nobody made a slider for the standard cab truck. When I first finished this truck with the four cylinder underneath the hood, I absolutely fell in love with it. It basically became what I referred to as my adventure truck. It wasn't a hardcore rock crawler, but it was a little bit more serious than an overlander. And it just kind of landed in that kind of middle of the road. I basically used it to go on a bunch of like weekend adventures, just bombing back roads, hitting mild trails here and there, and even camping out of it. Actually, I took this truck on a trip called the Yukon Adventure Truck, where I ended up sleeping in the bed of this truck for just under a week. Basically lived out of it, and the truck worked flawlessly. Well, except 
I lost the four cylinder engine. I already knew it was hurt when I bought it. It had low compression as one cylinder, but I was trying to push it for as long as I could. And on that trip, I ended up pushing the head gasket out of the truck. So that started me down the road of researching what swap was gonna be best for this Tacoma, or maybe I should just put another four cylinder underneath the hood. Now at the end of this video, I'm gonna go over all of the options that I looked at. I looked at putting an LS in this truck, doing a V6 swap in the truck, just replacing the four cylinder, or what I eventually ended up choosing to do, which was the 2UZ. Hopefully by the time we get to the end of this video, I will have covered every single step that is needed to get this engine underneath the hood of a second gen Tacoma and get it running and driving. So if you're planning this swap, this is the video for you. I'm gonna take you step by step through the entire process from building engine mounts to the wiring, to the plumbing, every single piece of the puzzle will be covered in this video. If I miss something or if you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments below. I'll make sure to respond because I know a lot of you have been asking me questions about this particular swap. So the first step we have to do is the engine is currently just mocked up inside the frame rails, basically sitting on a set of metal plates that I tacked onto the frame to test fit it to determine if I needed a rear sump pan. So before I can do anything, I've got to get the engine out of this truck. And since this is the last time that I'm going to be working on this truck, I'm going to take care of a few maintenance items that the previous owner did not. First, let's start with what engine is gonna go into this truck. It's a 2UZ Toyota, 4.7 liter, 32 valve V8. It's an iron block, aluminum head motor with overhead cams. Now there are a lot of variants of the 2UZ, but power-wise they land around 250 horsepower, just over 300 pound-feet of torque. They came in Tundras, Lexus, GX, and LX, Land Cruisers, 4Runners, and Sequoias, but they were never offered in the Tacoma. While planning this swap, I was lucky enough to find a 2004 Tundra that was in a wreck. It still ran and drove, so I knew the motor was fine. And if you're planning this swap, I honestly would suggest trying to find the same. I paid a thousand bucks for this Tundra, and based on the shape of the truck, I knew that maintenance was lacking. While the engine's out, I'm gonna replace the timing belt and the water pump. All right, so the timing belt and the new water pump are now on the motor. Um, this can be a little bit of a tricky job to do. So one thing that you should make sure before you officially pull the pin on that tensioner is rotate the engine a couple times just with the breaker bar um, and make sure that when you're doing it, all those timing marks line back up. So I rotated it twice and I'm still at zero here. I'm lined up with the timing mark up here, I'm lined up with the timing mark up there. What can happen is because the belt is basically tightened on this side with the tensioner, when you set the belt on, sometimes there can be slack on this side of the belt where there's nothing to take that slack up. So you kind of got to mess around with it, make sure this side, this side stays good and tight. So sometimes with the belt loose, you kind of got to put a wrench on here and work it a little bit and get this good and tight. So sometimes you gotta like jump a tooth on this, if that makes sense, and then rotate it once, make sure everything stays lined up. When it does, then you pull the pin out of the tensioner and that pushes up. It's like a little hydraulic shock here. It's pushing up on the tensioner and that is putting the pressure on the belt. And now I have my new water pump in and I definitely think this was the right decision. 
Because based on the look of the water pump and the gasket, this has obviously never been changed. I'm pretty sure this truck had over 200,000 miles on it. The motor ran great. No smoke, no nothing, no issues. So I'm sure the motor's good, but maintenance items like this, sometimes people uh, let slide. So with the, out of the truck, this is the time to do it. Another thing that I like to do when I'm working on these imports is I always put the bolts back in the holes uh, that they come out of. Um, unlike domestic vehicles, domestic stuff set, tends to reuse a lot of the same size fasteners. So you just kind of, it's very easy to get them all put back in there. But I found a lot of the time with the import stuff, it's often not that easy. The import stuff, they have different length fasteners all over the place. So I always try to put them back in the holes so I don't mix them up. Or I'll put them in the item that I took them out of. Uh, that uh, water neck right there, there's a thermostat in there that I'm going to change as well. So now what I'm going to do is basically just put everything back together on the front end of this motor because now this job is done. I can button everything up and then we'll tackle that starter. Tried removing this coolant crossover pipe with the idea of maybe I'd be able to sneak the starter up, sort of up and out, but there's just no way. It's too tall. It's got to go so far back and so far up that it's actually hitting the bottom of this intake manifold. Let's see if I can get you there to see. Um, it, it's close. I mean, you can get it out there and you can get it up, but then it hits the bottom before it clears this deck. So I think unfortunately that means that I Gonna have to remove the intake manifold to get that starter out of there. It's a bummer, but uh, eh, these things happen. Intake's off, and probably a good idea that I pulled it in the long run. It's pretty dirty in here. It looks like there's been some. Uh, mouse action underneath this intake so what i've done is i've plugged all the intake ports i'm going to grab my shop back and clean this up the only bummer to this is these intake gaskets apparently are a one-time use only item so i'm gonna have to run to the parts store pick up a set of intake manifold gaskets like i said i'll grab my shop vac vacuum this all out and then we can work on getting our new starter installed <music> The custom oil pan that is going on this engine, I got from a shop called Northwest Toys LLC. I got a bunch of stuff from them. So basically, I uh, gave them a specs on what I had, and they basically designed and had this pan fabricated for me. The reason that I've said multiple times that I think this is the first time there's ever been one of these uh, 2UZ or any of the UZ motors in underneath one of these Tacomas. 
um, especially still IFS, is because this pan is the first one they've ever built. Um, and the guy that builds these pans, there's only like one guy apparently in the States that builds them. And I had to send him a bunch of measurements back and forth and fingers crossed it's right. Uh, but basically what they ended up sending me was this custom rear sump pan with the sump kicked over. That's supposed to clear the front diff. Hopefully that works out okay. Uh, drain plug obviously in it. And then a new uh, dipstick hole right here. And then they also sent me a new dipstick, which is right here. So this new dipstick will go in that dipstick hole and then this pan will bolt up. What I'm gonna do is, um, this is gonna seem silly, uh, but before I actually install, oh, and then it also came with, obviously it has to have this, it came with a new windage tray uh, to replace the one that was in there and a new oil pump pickup tube, all that had to uh, come in as well because you have to have that stuff. Um, so what I'm actually going to do right now is, and this seems silly because it's going to make this a lot harder, um, I'm going to put the oil pan on, uh, no sealant, no anything. I'll put the windage tray on, I'll put the uh, oil pump pickup on. I'm going to bolt the oil pan down with a couple of bolts. Then I'm going to take the engine off the stand and I'm going to put it back in and make sure everything clears because I don't want to have to have this pan on there, silicone down, everything done, and then have to peel it off uh, and basically modify it because although I gave them tons of measurements and although we're like 99.9% .9 sure this pan is gonna work, like I said, this is the first time one of these pans has ever been built for this application. So by basically mocking it up this way, uh, I ensure that uh, uh, it'll be more work because it'll be basically off the stand in and then back out probably put it back on the stand to seal up the pan and everything um, but aside from that everything else is done on the motor timing belt done the water pump done new starter is on everything's finished uh, so once I get this oil pan in uh, then we can start talking about the wiring so this is one of those things like I told you there's not a lot of aftermarket support for this Toyota stuff so uh, it took a lot of hunting to find somebody that would build me this pan and that pan wasn't cheap i think it was like 700 800 bucks to have that pan made but it solves the problem that i need to have solved and once i get it in hopefully eh, hopefully it fits and it'll just be a, basically a test fit rip back out seal it up and we're good to go so here we go fingers crossed cross our fingers everybody we're gonna throw an oil pan in i was waking up this morning waking up before it's getting night Kind of heavy on my shoulders, tracking down some moments back in time. I could have swore that I was in it, down to every minute. Don't know what I was sipping, but I felt like I was doing fine. Oh my. Turns out that I just got a little bit south, just a little bit north of the Georgia line. back in basically mocked up where it's gonna sit it's not engaged um, with the transmission at all it's because that's kind of a nightmare to get all lined up but it is sitting on it's sitting a little bit forward of the mounts and everything on the frame so this is as low as it's gonna get it's gonna come back obviously as you can see there that side's sitting on the mount as well and everything looks good the pan fits down in this space perfect it's above the cross member um, as I said it's gonna come back a bunch here it's basically gonna go it's real close right here but it's the whole engines gonna come back this way uh, quite a bit probably two three inches uh, so now I have to make the decision as to how to put this engine in um, for good and I have a few options um, so I honestly think what I'm gonna do is pull that engine back out um, I do have to get bolts for that oil pan because the factory bolts from the mid pan won't work because they're all different lengths So I'm gonna have to figure out what bolts I need uh, run over and pick up a bunch of metric bolts um, And then I think what I'm gonna do is actually go inside the cab and disconnect the Shifters for the transfer case and the transmission and then probably also pull the drive shafts out uh, out of here because I think my plan will be to um, 
engine transmission just undo maybe undo these bolts right here there's a couple of bolts right here uh, that hold it uh, that's the mount that goes down into this transmission cross member and then what I can do is I can basically slide this entire transmission transfer case assembly back get the engine in place and then I can like line the clutch up and everything and then slide it forward I think getting getting the clutch and everything lined up with this particular oil pan is going to be too tricky because the oil pan has to sort of come over the, the front diff and then go down and go back the only other option I would have would be maybe drop the entire front diff out to put it in but I honestly think you know it's four bolts on this drive shaft four bolts on that drive shaft and four bolts here pull the shifters out and then this whole thing can just kind of i can put my transmission jack underneath here and just move it back and forth heck i could even just pull the whole thing out if i had to and then just slide it all back in if i had to as well so the most important thing here is that i know this oil pan is going to work that's super good i'm super happy about that and so now i am going to pull the engine back out of of the tacoma put it back on the stand, flip it back upside down. Uh, the nice thing is, is that does not use an oil pan gasket, it uses silicone. Uh, so I'll silicone the pan in once I figure out what bolts I need. This may seem like overkill pulling the transmission and transfer case out of this truck, but I honestly think it's just going to save me time trying to wrestle this all into place. So at this point in time, we've talked about the engine. Uh, I showed you the oil pan for this kit, and now this is uh, the adapter that I got. Now this adapter I got from XAT Racing, and the way it works is it's an adapter plate that goes in between the transmission and the Tacoma and the bell housing that had to come out of the Toyota Tundra. So when you buy this kit, they basically specify, get the bell housing off an automatic transmission Toyota Tundra. Luckily, the Toyota Tundra that I bought, it was, I think it was even two wheel drive. I think it was two wheel drive automatic, if I remember correctly. So I already had the bell housing. So then what you do is you basically bolt the adapter plate on and it bolts onto the transmission and the bell housing will then bolt onto the adapter plate and then it comes with this new internal slave cylinder that mounts inside and then you have the hydraulic lines you have to drill a hole for the lines to come out of to clear out of the transmission and then you have a bleeder line right here this is for uh, bleeding the clutch and then this line here whoops dropped it and then this line here will go up and attach to the master cylinder or the clutch master cylinder 
that is underneath the firewall. Uh, so now that I have those out, uh, I can work on getting the engine in for good. It's prepped, it's ready to go. You can see I gave the oil pan just a quick coat of black paint on there. I let it sit overnight with the RTV and then gave it a quick coat of black paint. I got the new dipstick tube installed on it. So now this can get flipped back over and now it can go into the truck. Along with the adapter plate from XAT Racing, I got a uh, flywheel and clutch assembly. Now this has a little bit of surface rust on it, and that's just because it's been, uh, it, the truck was sitting outside while I was waiting for that oil pan. So I got a flywheel and they offer a bunch of different versions. I just op opted for the uh, standard one, but then they uh, went ahead and sent me this uh, chromoly one, lightened chromoly one, because it was the one that they had in stock. So, uh, it's all in, it's got the uh, pilot bearing already, and then over here, I have my clutch and pressure plate assembly. I just went with a regular uh, heavy duty clutch and pressure plate assembly, nothing fancy there. And what I'm gonna do right now is, I'm gonna install it along with the uh, alignment tool just before I drop the engine into the engine bay. I honestly could probably do that underneath the truck because I've pulled the transmission out, but it'll just be easier to line it all up here and uh, put it in. So it was everything from XAT Racing was the adapter plate to adapt the transmission to the uh, to Tundra bell housing. So that came from them along with the flywheel and clutch and pressure plate assembly. So it was all the hard parts way to get this done. For motor mounts, what I ended up doing was I took the stock Tundra mounts um, and I actually just inverted them on the reg normally they'd sit the other way. Uh, so I flipped them 180 and bolted them up, had to trim a little piece of metal off of the end here. And then I just went and made little plates that welded on to the frame and that is what holds the motor in. Uh, I do have to figure out what I'm gonna do with the AC compressor lines. I'll have to have some of those made locally. Uh, we have a hydraulic shop down the road that will crimp lines like that. I'm gonna have to get a, a power steering, high pressure line, and the line for the uh, AC made. What I'll probably end up doing is before I drop this engine in, I might just loosen the line on that rack. I don't know, I gotta figure that out. I'm gonna decide in a second, we'll see what it looks like. Anyway, so, Pressure, pressure plate and clutch go on, and the engine goes in. Whenever you're lining up a clutch uh, and pressure plate and flywheel assembly, it's a good idea to go ahead and as you're tightening the bolts to move the move this sort of alignment tool in and out a bunch of times. That'll make sure that as you're putting it in, it's all the way down and all that kind of jazz. You don't, what you don't want is you, if you just put it in, tighten down one bolt really, really tight, what can actually happen is the disc can actually get a little bit cocked. So I like to make sure that it moves in and out. Another thing that I also do in cases like this, where I've got like a lot of different parts mashing together that I've never really done before, uh, I come over to the transmission and I make sure that the adapter tool has the same pilot bushing. I'll actually try the pilot bushing on the transmission, which I did. And then before I bolt the clutch up to the engine, I make sure that it splines onto the transmission input shaft correctly, which this one did. Um, the last thing you want is to be underneath the truck, wrestling this all in to only realize that either the uh, pilot bearing or pilot bushing is wrong or the splines on the clutch are wrong because there's a lot of stuff here that a 
as I said before, this hasn't been done a lot, so there's not a lot of, you know, oh, use this clutch, this pressure plate, all that kind of stuff. I'm kind of relying on a bunch of different aftermarket companies to jive together on this. Um, and now all the hard parts are in. So now I'm gonna drop the engine in and then we can work on getting the transmission and transfer case back underneath the truck. Transfer case now back in, both drive shafts hooked up, transmission back in, still have to do the shifters. You can see plenty of room with this custom oil pan, it's a little dark down here, but you can see it works around perfectly, goes around the steering, goes around that front axle. Tons of room, lots of room at the front right here uh, to clear. Everything clears the steering rack, clears everything, everything is in here, still have the Oil filter is easily accessible, which is nice. I can easily get to this power steering line on this rack, which is one line that I'm gonna have to have custom made. And I was glad I'm gonna be able to get to that uh, with the engine in place. I was worried I was gonna have to like fight that underneath there. But now, uh, now we can focus on making the engine run. So we now have a drivetrain in place, engines permanently mounted, transmission back in, transfer case back in. Uh, I have to deal with the hydraulics for the clutch. That's number one. Uh, number two, I have to do with the electronics and the wiring that I need to do to make this engine function. And then number three, I'll have to do with fuel delivery. And then finally, engine cooling, which should honestly be the easiest one because I think I'm just going to end up tossing an electric fan on this thing. But now you can get an idea of what it all looks like. Let's take a quick look with it underneath the hood. So we'll lower the car down or truck down, I should say. <coughs> All right, engine in place underneath the hood. You can see it sits nice and low, which is perfect. It's not sticking up really high. There's room for everything. I was able to basically build a mount for this uh, power steering, which actually just mounts out off that valve cover. I think I'm gonna change that a little bit because it is hitting on that fender, but I can easily fix that. Over here, I can still get to the uh, compressor, the, or the uh, AC lines, because I'll have to put new AC lines on it, custom AC lines, I have to go down there. That's easily accessible. Uh, pretty much everything on the motor is easy to get to. I have, uh, that's the vacuum line for the, uh, I have the vacuum line for the master booster that's gonna go there. I have two heater hose connections that are gonna go there. That's easily taken care of. And lots of room at the front of the motor. I don't think I can fit the clutch fan. Um, I may go ahead and try it just to see if I can. That'd be pretty sweet. I'd much rather have a mechanical fan on the front of this truck than an electric fan. Just uh, personal preference. But I think what I'll do is I think I'll measure. Um, I think I'll measure with the radiator in there. But my gut tells me I think the best thing to do is put a couple electric fans on that. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna work on is the plumbing and I'm gonna start with the fuel lines. Now, the first one was pretty easy. This is the return line. Uh, the factory return line on the 4.7 V8 just had a little barb fitting with a clamp and I was able to just reuse the line from the four cylinder, even with the bends in it, it's perfect. Now, the hard part is the pressure line. Now, the pressure line on the 4.7, it uses what a lot of, lot of modern vehicles use. It's like this plastic, um, fuel hose or fuel line. Um, I think they switched over to this because it is very ethanol friendly, unlike rubber hose. Now, coming from the truck on the uh, four cylinder was the same size uh, plastic hose with a rubber protective sheath on it. This one also had a rubber protective sheath and I cut it off. 
The reason I cut it off is one thing you have to be really careful with this plastic hose is you can kink it very easily. And you can see it's been kinked right here, uh, probably during engine removal or just moving it around as well as the intake. And it also has a little kink right there. And the problem is, is that kink, uh, that causes, that means that can split. So right now, I think what I'm going to try and do is basically the way this hose works is you have to kind of heat it up. Uh, there is a special tool you can use, um, but you can just give it a little bit of heat and it, it usually will become slightly pliable and I think I'll be able to slide it over that barbed fitting and then when it cools down, it'll basically seal up. Um, if that doesn't work, what I'll end up doing is just replacing this entire hose with a piece of EFI fuel line uh, because the end over here is barbed right here at the engine. So let's say barbed uh, section right here. So I could put a piece of EFI fuel line over here. And then this is also a barbed fitting on the other end of it. I could just cut the rubber off, put a barbed fitting on here and it would work just fine. But I'm gonna try and reuse uh, this factory line just because it's in there. And then if I wreck it, it's no big deal because I can just replace it anyway. So that's what I'm gonna try right now. I'm basically going to uh, cut the old line off, get the new line on. Sometimes you can get it over the end of that, just the first barbed, and then I'll add some heat and see if I can just slide it over. We'll see if it works. I've never done this before. I watched a bunch of videos on how to do this repair. Uh, hopefully it works. If it doesn't work, we'll just resort to plan B. All right, so I gotta go to plan B. Um, I couldn't get this to go over that barb. Um, uh, I put heat to it and then what happened is it just started to kink on me when I was putting it on there. There is a tool you can buy that will expand this nylon uh, fuel line out. I don't have it. Um, and so instead of messing around with this and trying to get a tool, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to plan B. I have this, um, this is actual 5 16 uh, Gates fuel injection hose, rubber hose. And it's only a short little run. It's got to go basically... Uh, from that quick connection right there over to there. And I have uh, what are called perma clamps to work with this. So they're not, um, they're not like hose clamps, or like worm gear clamps. They're clamps that you basically clamp on and you cannot get them off. You have to cut them off. There's no way to take them apart. So I'm gonna take that uh, nylon line off that quick connect fitting and that's what I'll use to connect this whole thing together. <laughs> Fuel pump in the Tacoma has enough flow to power the 4.7, so it stays in the tank. Check out this craziness. So this is the EVAP. Uh, Basically, this just came off the Tundra and it connected back to the fuel tank and it's part of the EVAP canister or basically, you know, unburnt fuel or, you know, vent. This is the vent for the uh, fuel tank is right here. And we've cut the same thing on the uh, V8 and it's just laying here pointing right at it. It's like, oh, hook me up to here. It's like... It, it's exactly where it needs to go. Like I was, this has to go down to the fuel tank and this is lined up and pointed at the fuel tank. This is hilarious. So I originally was planning to just leave this, just basically plug this and ignore it. But my goodness, this is too, this is too perfect. So all I got to do is just take a tiny little chunk of hose and just connect these two together. And then uh, that basically, that's the vent for the fuel tank. And it's basically going to be working along with the uh, EVAP system, which is awesome. That's pretty cool for this whole thing to be just sort of falling in like this. Heater hose routing is pretty self-explanatory. There is two ports on the back of the motor. You simply attach the 5 8 hose from them to the heater core inlets on the firewall.
Now in order to engage the clutch, I need to hook up that internal slave cylinder to the clutch master cylinder on the firewall. Now my kit came with this fitting right here. Now this fitting is uh, often seen in a lot of modern uh, hydraulic systems. This actually is very similar to what you see in a Jeep. Basically the way it works is there's an O-ring that goes on the end and then there's a little split lock uh, pin that basically holds it in place. And this adapts to the dash three for my clutch line that's going inside that transmission. The problem is, is the Tacoma does not use this style of connection. It uses a basically an, a flared fitting with a uh, basically a big old tube nut on it. Now, uh, obviously this came with my kit, so I could not use it. So what I did is I went ahead and I ordered this fitting and I'll put a link to this as well as all the other parts in the description below. This is an M10 by 1.0 to dash three AN or sometimes referred to as dash three JIC. This will simply screw into the master cylinder. I'll tighten it down and then I can hook the line up to that. And then the actual clutch hydraulic system is fed from the brake master cylinder. So I'll pressurize the brake master cylinder with my pressure pop bottle, and then I can bleed the hydraulic clutch. The internal slave cylinder in this kit is an F body T56 slave. Now it requires a three quarter inch bore clutch master cylinder. Luckily, the Tacoma from the factory is a three quarter inch bore. I finished up all the plumbing on this side of the motor. So vacuum hose over to the booster. My two fuel lines are hooked up. That EVAP canister down here going into the intake. And then lastly, uh, two 5 8 heater hose just comes off the uh, fittings on the back of the motor over into the heater hose connections over there. And that should take care of everything on that back corner of the motor. I think what I'll do now is maybe move up forward here. Um, what I have to do at this point is work on figuring out radiator, radiator hose. You can see that the uh, 4.7 has a rather unique, it looks like this would be what goes to the lower side of the radiator and then this would go to the upper or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's like an LS, maybe this goes to the lower that goes to the upper. I think I'll take a look online as to what the uh, uh, radiator looks like for the Tundra. I have a new radiator for the Tacoma. So I'll basically drop it in and figure out some uh, radiator hoses for it. I compared the physical size of the Tundra radiator to the Tacoma and they're very close in physical size. So I'm very certain that a Tacoma radiator is gonna keep this engine cool under the hood. Okay, next piece of the puzzle, the plumbing is gonna be the AC lines. Uh, the reason I'm doing those is because there's a local shop. I can crimp my AC lines and my high pressure power steering line for me. I just need to basically mock it all up and take it down there and drop it off and they'll build me the lines and crimp them. So the way it works is I have the original lines off of the, this is off the Tundra right here. This is the small line that comes off the Tundra. I've got it uh, basically bolted down to the AC compressor. It comes up and this one actually worked out really good because it would basically be this line on the Tacoma. And you can see right here, all I need to do is have them basically cut this, cut this crimp off I need to have them cut this crimp off and then just recrimp this line like this. So what I'm going to do is I'll mark this and mark that and then I'll take take that out and then it can go down. It just comes around here to the front, goes through the firewall, goes in here to the condenser in the front of the car. And then the next one I got to work on is this one. This one's going to be a little bit trickier because it's got this, um, I don't know what that is. It's got this big old thing on it and it's going to go in down there and come across and it needs to hook up to basically this line right here so probably what i'm gonna have to do is hook it up and then cut it and give them a length of line of what i'll need and what they'll do is they'll basically assemble it for me and then i'll mark the orientation and the clocking of the fittings and then they'll crimp them so but this one I'm going to mark and I'll take it out and then I'll put that big one in. 
and then those will be ready to go. Then we can do power steering lines for that. Truck's got to go up in there. All right, so I was able to tweak that just enough to clear everything. Um, this little bracket, I don't know what it does. I'm probably just gonna take it off there. It doesn't really do anything. Um, so now this AC line will come up. What I'll probably end up doing is just have them basically cut that crimp off. We'll do, redo that crimp and just give me enough flexible line to come all the way across here and then just come over into this uh, section right here this still needs a little bit of manipulating and everything um one thing you want to make sure whenever you're doing these ac lines if you're going to be replacing them make sure you still have your high and low pressure port so on this truck there's a pressure port right there and then there's a pressure port out here that is underneath or behind the grill you need those for charging the system but that's it so now so now the ac lines are done i'll just pull a measurement on that one uh, make sure I've got what I need and I'll put the truck up in the air and we can take a look at our power steering lines. Power steering line is actually going to be pretty simple. Basically, the rack is basically right up in here and it has a high pressure line and a return line. Uh, this is the return line here. You can always tell the return line because it's just going to have like a regular clamp. Oh, it's a little dark up in there. Let's get that up there. The return line, because it always just has like a regular spring clamp. So it's just going to come up here like this. So this is just a long piece of rubber hose I need to replace. A long one of these to go all the way up to the uh, reservoir and then this is the pressure line right here what i'll do is i'm going to take a couple measurements off of it and uh, i have the fitting up on the actual pump from the tundra and so i'll just do the same thing I'll just crimp a line for them but i have to disconnect it from the rack to do that and i just take a measurement and then we're done So I got my AC lines all marked as well as my power steering lines. I am going to try and change up the return line. I think I'm going to run a hard line uh, for part of it up underneath the cross member and then kick it up into the uh, bottle. But I think I'll wait until I get the pressure line built and that way I can sort of run them alongside each other. So now at this point, we're done the plumbing. Uh, I do need to do uh, upper and lower radiator hoses. Uh, but this radiator hose basically just has to come around and come over into here. And the lower hose has got to go down. It's bent up right now, but it goes down and goes over into the lower on that side. I'm waiting to do that until I get my mechanical fan because I want to make sure that everything is free and clear of the fan because I think this is just going to come up like this and then kick around and come back here and then a tight 90 right there. So now we can start talking about the most difficult part of this swap now i knew i had two plans at this point so the reason i bought the entire toyota tundra pickup truck is because i had a theory that worst case scenario literally i would just strip the entire wiring harness out of that tundra transport it and install it in the tacoma and that is how i would get the engine running and luckily i didn't have to do that so um, here's a couple things that I bought that I shouldn't have bought. So this is a transmission emulator that I got from the same place where I got my adapter. Um, if you read the website, this is a plug and play transmission emulator and you just put that in there and that Tundra will think it's got an automatic transmission in it because what can happen with this swap is I now have the two UZ engine in place and the ECU is uh, from an automatic transmission truck. And if the, if the truck does not, or the vehicle doesn't see transmission inputs, it puts the engine into limp mode, basically pulls all the power out of it because it thinks there's something wrong with the transmission. So you need to make the transmission think 
or the truck rather think that the transmission is there and after looking at that and trying to figure out how to hook it up i would just i did like a little bit of research the guy sent me like a youtube video and i'm like no not gonna work so don't buy that what you do instead is call these guys right here so you want same place i got the oil pan from so northwest toys up in i believe they're up in the pacific northwest so i contacted them talk to them through this entire process of the wiring and i got two different wiring harnesses from them so this is a complete engine conversion wiring harness that should work along with my tundra ecu and the tacoma ecu that is underneath the hood that should make everything work as it would work if this thing was came from the factory with that uh, v8 underneath the hood and then also from them i got this automatic to manual transmission resistor pack so this is a legit plug and play that will fool the ecu over here into thinking that there is a uh, functioning transmission underneath the uh underneath the truck and will keep me from having any issues the nice thing is is it does have an obd2 port so we'll be able to scan it for any type of trouble codes in the future now this is where as i said before there's very little aftermarket support for these toyotas i couldn't like if this was an ls i could you know fire up hp tuners take a factory computer and reflash it and work through that this is not like that at all this is a very complicated swap um so luckily not only did uh, Northwest Toys get me the uh, harness, they also gave me very, very detailed instructions on how to make it work. So basically routing, there's basically routing the, the donor engine wiring harness. So this is what's on my truck right now. This is the reds, the conversion harness, where it goes underneath the dash. Uh, all There's some splices here that I have to do into the factory harness. Um, and then it sort of shows here the accelerator pedal here, as well as the OBD2 connector here. Uh, a lot of this is the factory. The gray is the is factory underdash wiring, so we don't touch any of that. Um, and then uh, over here, it shows it where it's got to run down to connect to downstream O2s, transmission transfer case connectors, and then a fuel pump and an EVAP connector at the back. That's also part of that conversion harness. So, uh, and then there's also an underhood. Hold on, I might have, there it is. Dun, 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 dun. Come on. They also gave me an underhood diagram as well. Just got to dig it out of the stack here. Come on. And then there's also an underhood layout for everything that I have to do. The blue is obviously the Dorner wiring harness. That's where that is. And then the red is what I need to mount right now. Um, you'll see basically this just all has to hook up. So what I need to do right now is start underneath the hood. So go over here and look at the truck. So what I have right here is, um, this is my donor harness. Oops, this is my donor engine harness, wiring harness. Um, I didn't take any of this off. This was all connected uh, from the uh, factory. And the only time, only time I disconnected it uh, was to basically unplug those injectors to swap that uh, starter, but that's all done. So I got to get this uh, through the firewall. There's a hole already back there, so it's going to punch through there. And then I need to also get the donor harness laid out onto here, and it's going to work with my factory fuse block. Uh, these are the transmission wires that I was talking about before. This normally hooks up to the transmission that is behind this uh, 47, so I have the connectors to connect to that. So what I'm going to do right now, start laying out the harness. Um, and then we'll go through it as I connect it up. So, but I'm gonna start underneath the hood, just laying everything out and getting it where it is supposed to go. And as we hook things up, I'll show you them as we go. But like I said before, this would not be possible without the guys at Northwest Toys. Uh, they had did a great job with not only the oil pan, all of this wiring harness, that this is basically a plug and play install. First connections with this harness were super easy. They just go up into the original Tacoma fuse block and just plug in. There's one, two, three connectors that go in. Uh, the big wire uh, from the alternator on the 
uh, 2UZ goes into the lug inside here. This is the power feed for the fuse block. So this will go onto the positive battery terminal. And then this is the feed for the starter on the 2UZ. So that'll go on the positive as well. And then I have this ground wire as well that also goes down to right to the motor, which is nice. And then obviously I'll have, you have to have a body ground for everything to work. And then the other connection over here just basically plugs in. This is the feed. Uh, it's easy. It's super easily labeled right here. You can just, it's just a note to plug this uh, engine side under the hood left hand side so it's this this plugs in this energizes the starter so now all I have to do is um, run the rest of the harness across the firewall on the back and then I'll punch it through the factory hole on that side I'll put both harnesses through so I'll have the original harness from the 2UZ it's gonna have to go through the hole as well as my new conversion harness has to go through that hole as well. I now have my Tundra ECU mounted where the Tacoma ECU originally mounted. I've plugged in the three connectors from the engine harness and then these two top connectors from my conversion harness. I have a, I hooked up the, there's a lever lock connector right here that I had to hook up. So this lever lock connector uh, comes from the conversion harness basically into the body harness. I have a relay that I need to mount. I have a ground that I need to install. But where I'm at right now is these two bundles of loose wires. Now these two bundles of loose wire need to splice into these original connectors that plugged into the um, factory ECU for the Tacoma. Now they give you very simple uh, instructions. Basically gives you the connector number and the pin number and the color of the wire that you need to tap into. The problem is they didn't give me one of the most important things that I needed to have, and that was an ECU pinout label. So I knew I was in the right connector and the right pin. Now, luckily, I have a friend, Lawrence L.T. Tolman. If you don't know who he is, I used to work with him on one of my other TV shows. He's a great mechanic, super knowledgeable, very, very smart guy. Uh, he now runs a YouTube channel and a shop out in Colorado. I'll put a link to one of his videos up here so you can find him. Anyway, I called him up and asked him for a uh, connector pinout chart, and he was able to get one for me, which was awesome. And so he basically sent me the image, and this is what one of those looks like. It's basically out of a service manual and what you'll have is the connector number and the number of the pin inside that connector and so i know that i'm working with connectors e7 and e8 and now i can go in here and i can look at these uh, bundles of loose wires right here and i know that this one right here this is connector e7 and i am looking for pin number four which should be a blue wire i can then look at the pinout chart and determine where connector number four is so that's one two three four from the right and that should be a blue wire so i should spin this around and go one two three four and i'll have a blue wire right there so that should be that wire that gets attached to that one right there hopefully all these pinouts work out what i'm going to do is i'm going to go through and triple check everything make sure it's right and then it's just a matter of doing a whole bunch of splicing and crimping and heat shrinking, attaching them all together. It's gonna to take a little bit of time, but I'll get it done. Without this pinout diagram, it would be very easy to confuse wires and colors. So by following the pinout and taking my time, I can integrate the conversion harness into this truck very easily.
Now the harness just comes down from the motor, basically falls down. Uh, I have all the connections for the transfer case, four high, four low, all that kind of stuff. Downstream O2s, as well as everything down here at the back for the EVAP canister. Just like everything else, it's all labeled. Just got to follow along and plug it in. Uh, you do need to swap over from your donor vehicle uh, parts of the EVAP uh, system. So this is the EVAP canister that's underneath the bed of the Tacoma, and this is the solenoid that activates it. You can see this is a lot more complicated than the solenoid that is on the 47V8. I'd thought about just swapping this solenoid over into the canister, which I could have done, but when I started taking these bolts out, they just started breaking. So I made the decision just go ahead and swap over the entire canister. The nice thing is, is it's virtually identical. The only difference is this uh, hose and this are in a different spot, but every Everything else is pretty much in the exact same position. So all I need to do now is put this up underneath the truck and plug in the connector. So now we're at the point where all the engine conversion harness stuff is done. And now I need to work on the next wiring harness I got. Now I showed you the uh, transmission emulator that I bought that I should not have bought. That was not a good idea. So instead I went back to Northwest Toys and I got one of their transmission emulators and it's a lot better. So basically what it is, is it's a resistor pack. So it's a bunch of resistors mounted on this plate that will mount underneath the hood. I think I'm gonna mount it over here somewhere. Um, and then uh, the rest of the harness comes over and what it does is it basically just plugs into all of the connectors that would normally hook up to the transmission. Now, uh, luckily I kept the transmission out back so I know what all these connectors are. So this connector here is for the um, input uh, speed sensor. So that's the first connector that comes down the line. And then as you move your way down here, this is the uh, basically for the shift solenoids inside the transmission. This, this connector here is for the output shaft speed sensor. And then these two connectors would be for uh, downstream O2s, I believe. Um, but I don't have those, so I don't need to worry about those because um, this was a two-wheel drive transmission. So I think these were downstream O2s, but we're not going to worry about those. I don't have those in this setup. Uh, over here, this is what's called the Prindle switch. Um, that stands for Park Reverse Drive, Park Reverse Neutral Drive Low Prindle. So this is a switch on the side of the transmission that tells the computer what gear you're in. The only wires that I might need here are I may need to jump uh, these two wires, because uh, that is the park, uh, neut basically a neutral safety switch in this system. So I need to jump these two together so the vehicle thinks that it, it is in park when we start it. And then lastly, this is a transmission temp sensor, and I will, ne will need to cut these wires and splice two wires into them that came in the harness, uh, because I guess there's not a connector for that. So I basically have the harness is labeled here. This is uh, spliced to transmission temp sensor, one and two. I talked to the harness builder. He said, basically, when you look at this connector, this is one and this is two. So I just need to cut and splice those into there. And then the rest is plug and play. And that should finish up the wiring. So the harness for the transmission also has this extra loom in it. And this is specifically designed for if you get a performance trouble code when you get all the wiring done uh, because the resistor pack is not uh, fully functioning, doing its job to basically trick the ECU. And what you need to do is you need to come up with a, a wave generator so you can get that from uh, Dakota Digital. They give you that information and I'm not gonna buy it now until I know if I need it. So what I'm gonna do right now is uh, just leave this harness just zip tied underneath the hood. And then if I do get that trouble code 
uh, after I get the engine running, then I can go ahead and figure out uh, how to wire in or if I need to wire in this Dakota Digital part. And if I do, then I'll show you that. But as it is right now, all the wiring is done. So we have all the engine harness and everything is underneath the uh, truck. Everything's hooked up, throttle, uh, throttle pedals hooked up. The um, uh, the ALDL connector is underneath there. Everything's wired up underneath the truck, which is good. Uh, fuel lines are done, vacuum lines are done. And so really at this point, uh, I just have to finish up a couple little things and this engine should fire. So I'm gonna go ahead and take care of all that stuff. I'm gonna do the uh, radiator hoses, that power steering line, the AC line, put some get, get some coolant in it, get an air filter on it, all that kind of stuff. up this morning waking up before it's getting nine kind of heavy on my shoulders tracking down some moments back in time i could swore that i was in it down to every minute don't know what i was sipping but i felt like i was doing fine oh my Finally, I got to build a custom exhaust and I'm saving the flanges from the factory 4.7 exhaust manifolds and then welding them onto a pile of Magnaflow pipe all out of a two and a half inch universal builder's kit. And I'm using one of their high performance, high flow mufflers. Sudden comfort hanging with my friends all playing games We all started at a full house and ate up just me and good old James I could swore that I was winning kinda had a feeling last thing I remember I was drinking till the moon shine Oh my Turns out that I just got a little bit south just a little bit north of the Georgia line So before we jump in the truck and hit the key for the very first time, let's just review once again what is going on underneath the hood of this truck. So factory fuel lines are coming from the tank hooked up to the engine. Two 5 8 heater hose hooked up to the barb on the engine. I have my clutch feeder line coming out of the factory master cylinder on the firewall clutch master going down to the internal hydraulic slave. Uh, this k and cold air intake came with my Tundra, so I reused it. This upper radiator hose is actually off of a 2007 Chevrolet 1500. I just had to splice it here and manipulate it slightly. Uh, I have custom AC lines made locally using a Tundra end on one end and the Tacoma end on the other. Uh, factory Tacoma uh, radiator, the four cylinder and the six cylinders take the same radiator and I was able to use the factory 4.7 clutch fan, just mounted it on the engine, had to trim the shroud slightly, but the clutch fan fit in its place. And I have all the conversion wiring hooked up and everything is done. I think that covers everything that was done underneath the hood. Now, let's talk about how much this cost and whether I should have done it in the first place. So let's talk turkey on this swap. What did it cost? So first let's look at the option I had of just replacing the four cylinder that was in this truck. 
Now, I searched and searched for a replacement four-cylinder, and I honestly couldn't find anything less than $4,000, even for a high-mileage used motor and a brand-new rebuilt long block. Well, it landed right around $4,500. And I figured if I'm going to put that much money into this truck, I might as well do some type of engine swap. I then considered putting an LS into the truck. Now I've done a ton of LS swaps in my day and a normal price for that swap in a truck is anywhere from five to $10,000. For this truck, it honestly would have been an entire drivetrain swap. So engine, trans and transfer case to make it all work. That means that I'd have to come up with all new shifters, all new drive shafts. I'd have to come up with some sort of gauges to monitor all that and more. It would have been more work and believe it or not, a lot more money than doing this 2UZ swap. The costs for the 2UZ were as follows. So I told you I got the Tundra for a thousand bucks. All the hard parts, so the adapters and the clutch and the flywheel and everything, that was $1,300. The oil pan was 800. My conversion harness was 1200. The emulator that I didn't use, I spent 200 bucks on. The emulator that I ended up using cost me 450 bucks. It was $150 to get new AC lines crimped, 80 bucks to have my high pressure power steering line made. Exhaust, I'm saying around 500 bucks because I basically only used half of the builder kit and one muffler. And then I'm tossing in another 500 bucks for miscellaneous things like plumbing, connectors, battery, engine cover, all that kind of stuff. So a grand total, $6,180 to get this 2UZ underneath the hood of this Tacoma running and driving and functioning like it came that way from the factory. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what engine swaps you've got planned in the future. And if you've got a Tacoma and you want to 2Z swap it, go ahead. It's the right decision. First test drive of our 2Z swapped Toyota Tacoma. About to pull out of the shop for the very first time here. Let's see what happens. I think I still have some air in the clutch master. Blended the best I could, bleeding it by myself, but it's a little tricky to shift, so I'm at, and the clutch is pretty close to the floor, so I think that's what it is, but we'll worry about that later. Right now, we're going for a drive. Oh my gosh, hold on, let me, let me get this propped up better so you don't fall down. Here we go. There we go. All right. truck holy wow got lots of noise coming from those brakes because they've been sitting for so long Get that clutch fixed. That's annoying. That air is just annoying. But 